We have, I've taught you two terms. Cataclysmos was the Greek term for the destruction of the world by water. Ekparosis was the Greek term for the destruction of the world by fire. We spent a lot of time in here looking scientifically now the scientific evidence of how the world has been destroyed by water through cosmic floods. We've spent some time looking now at cosmic fires. When we go back to October 8, 1871, we find a microcosmic analog for the ekpyrosis of the ancient Greeks or the apocalyptic fires of the book of Revelations or all the other traditions. We can look here at um, very briefly looking at some of these that I've collected from various sources which are always being interpreted by the scientific community as being purely allegorical or metaphorical or metaphysical or psychological if they have any scientific validity at all. They're not looked upon as historical. Therein is a great mistake. When we turn to these traditional sources, I think we have to look at them as, as history. This is what I have written here. Ancient myths and religious prophecies are replete with tales of world destruction and catastrophe resulting from all-consuming fires. Analogous with ancient tales of universal destruction from a great deluge, only a few survivors remain in the aftermath to replenish the race. The ancient Greeks told such tales and referred to the process of world destruction through fire as ekpyrosis, the counterpart to cataclysmos, or world destruction by flood. The biblical account relates that the world was previously destroyed through the agency of water and will suffer destruction through fire at some unspecified future date, which is euphemistically referred to as Judgment Day. As with the flood story, the vision of a world-destroying fiery holocaust was by no means limited to the Greeks or to the Bible, but is found in dozens, if not hundreds, of traditions from all over the world. The Mayan codices, direct quote right out of the codices, at the close of the ages it hath been decreed the world shall be purged with a ravening fire. From the Mahabharata, the Indian tradition, at the end of the Yuga when men become fierce and destitute of virtue, then does the Yuga be come to an end. And the course of the winds will be confused and agitated and innumerable, very important detail right here, innumerable meteors will flash through the sky foreboding evil. And then the sun will appear with six others of the same kind. And all around will be din and uproar and everywhere there will be conflagrations. Fires will blaze up on all sides when the end of the yuga comes. Now if you read your Vedic traditions you discover that the great cycles, the yugas, the kalpas and so on, are directly tied in with this series of cosmic events. They describe, they're giving us direct information here that needs to be interpreted scientifically. The sun will appear with six others of the same kind. Does that mean that six other suns are going to suddenly appear in the sky? No, not, not stars, but something which from our perspective may provide a source of light as bright or as intense as our own sun. Could be a reference to the age. Well, and there could possibly be. I will not claim that I have the final word on any of this. From traditions of Brazil, talking about their god of fire, Monan, without beginning or end, author of all that is, seeing the ingratitude of men and their contempt for him who had made them thus joyous, withdrew from them and sent upon them Tata, the divine fire which burned all that there was on the surface of the earth. The Hopis talk about when it rained fire on the earth and the people took refuge underground. The, the Norse traditions talk about from the Voluspa or the Eddas, the, the elder Eddas. Cirque from the south comes with flickering flame. The sun darkens. Earth in ocean sinks. Isn't that what we were just talking about? Fall from heaven the bright stars. Fire's breath assails the all-nourishing tree. Towering fire plays against heaven itself. Now see, once we begin to appreciate 
and recognize that these ancient traditions are actually very precise, scientifically encoded knowledge, we will be able to advance at a whole new rate. Because we have ignored these traditions thinking that they were the outgrowth of a superstitious, pre-literate, unscientific mind. That's not what they are. They're as precise in their symbolism as modern science is. And when modern science begins to recognize that, we will begin to be able to look at those and begin to decode these ancient traditions in a new light. South American tribes, now this is important right here. South American tribes represent the last destruction of the world to have been by water. A few, however, the Takhalis of the North Pacific coast, the Uracaris of the Bolivian Cordillera, and the Mbakobi of Paraguay attribute it to a general conflagration which swept over the whole earth, consuming every living thing except a few who took refuge in a deep cave. Now, are we to assume that these accounts, of which I've shown you only a small smattering here, are just completely conjured up out of nothing, that they're completely fanciful? When you say North Pacific Coast, you mean the North Pacific Coast of South America, yes. Well, I'm going to skip through a whole bunch of this stuff, but you can see how many quotes I have here. Um, if you read the Bible, you're going to discover that the Bible is full of prophecies of cosmic fire. Floods. And floods, yes. The book of Revelation. When See... The book of Revelation is a scientific document describing the science of earth change, the relation of the earth to the cosmos, and how they interact. The angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. Sure, that's symbolical, but just as in science, we use the, 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 the realities of science, the facts of science, are conveyed through symbols. Here we have symbols. The symbol is an angel, but behind it is a very real, natural process. There were voices, thunderings, and lightnings, and an earthquake, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of the trees was burnt up, and all the green grass was burnt up. Now, I can give you guys this with all of these references so you can read it yourself. You do recall this from the crucifixion story, the symbol. What does this say up here? What is that? What is Enri? Right? The story was that in mockery, Pontius Pilate put a, put a, 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 a sign. King of the Jews. Almost. Jesus Nazarenos Rex Eudorum. Jesus Nazarenus Rex Eudorum. What is that? Jesus of Nazareth, king of... The Jews. Yes. Okay. However, what was the formula that it conceals that the alchemists understood? The alchemists understood that this was the outer meaning, but there was an inner meaning, another acronym that is also concealed by I-N-R-I. In the Latin... What is the Latin first? What is the Latin? Igni, natura, renovator, integra. Igni, natura, renovator, integra. Through fire, nature is wholly renewed. And that is the formula that is actually concealed within this story. And so, with all of these, they're allegories, yes, but they conceal references to real, historic, and or scientific processes. The alchemists understood the Igni Natura Renovator Integra formula, and they understood that the crucifixion was a teaching event. It was a staged teaching event, staged for the human race at the dawn of the Piscean Age, so at the dawn of the Aquarian Age, we would be able to extract from it the major lessons about cosmic change that is governed by the unfolding cycles of the great year. And so we have the descent of the cosmic fire. And I'm not going to reiterate the whole story about the Chicago fire and so forth. That would be something we should do at some point to a larger audience because as you can see here I'm skipping over the bulk of this information. 
Um, and we did spend a couple of meetings already presenting this material. So for the sake of the folks that have already been here, I'm not going to... Um, okay, but the important facts that we need to take with us. The Pashtigo fire, the um, Chicago fire occurred on what date, Dolores? October 8th. October 8th. What time of day? Uh, 8, 8, 9 p.m. Yeah, 9 p.m. 9 p.m. is close enough. The, the, the single fact that you should put together here on this is that the greatest, most catastrophic urban fire in the history of America happened at October 8, 1871, 9 o'clock in the evening. That was the Great Chicago Fire, usually blamed on Mrs. O'Leary's cow, right? The date, again, October 8, 1871, 9 o'clock in the evening. It would happen to be a Sunday, by the way. Well, the greatest, most destructive forest fire in North American history simultaneously broke out in northern Wisconsin on October 8, 1871 at 9 o'clock in the evening. And killed more people. Well, yeah, and killed about 1,500 people just like that. Mm -hmm. I think Chicago only killed, what, five, 600? Well, that's normally, by those who are aware of it, that's normally considered to be just a very unique coincidence. However, I don't believe in coincidences. So, when you look at that timing of that event, you go back, you discover that, how many years was it before in Nova Scotia, we discovered up until that time, the greatest firestorm documented in the North American continent was the Miramichi Fire of Nova Scotia in 1830-something. I forgot the year. It also broke out at October 8th, 9 o'clock in the evening. Coincidence? Okay. So, what I think would be a very valuable exercise is you go through and you read the apocalyptic literature, the ancient prophets describing these events, what they're experiencing, what they're seeing, what they're witnessing, what they're thinking, etc. You, 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 you imbibe all of that, then you go and you begin to read the accounts of these survivors of these fires, and you discover that they're using the same imagery, the same allegorical language, the same words even, to describe what they're experiencing. Yeah, when you read this, what you discover is the same thing over and over and over again. People who had lived in the forests all their lives, this is the Chicago fire, people who had lived in the forests all their lives, who had seen many forest fires, knew how to survive forest fires, they created fire breaks, they created clearings around their villages. You recall that the Peshtigo fire uh, let's let's go up here a little further. We're going to get past Chicago and go to Peshtigo. And here we have the city reborn from the ashes of America's most disastrous forest fire, October 8, 1871. I guess that would have been about 1996. That's when we were filming for the Fire from the Sky documentary. Just to prove that I was actually there. Well, we read that last week, and I would love to read it again, but we don't want to go on for. Um, done this. Okay. Go. We've done this, so yeah, I, I want to get to the stuff we didn't do. Review the map so you can see Wisconsin, Chicago, of course, is down here. Peshtigo is right there. This is the Door Peninsula, and that's what we're going to talk about a story about what happened on the Door Peninsula because the fires swept up both sides of Green Bay. Now, when you read the eye eyewitness descriptions, of course, you're reading something very, very profound. And, of course, what do the people describe? They describe fire not coming from the forests, but coming from where? The sky. Coming from the sky, yes. Coming from the over and over. These are the consistent accounts of the survivors is that they looked up and the fire wasn't coming from the forest, it was coming down from out of the sky. It rained, literally rained fire. But it gets even more weird than that. We saw that in some of the accounts of the people, this was the village, 
that essentially got completely, completely erased from the map by the firestorm. People, the survivors are the ones that took refuge here in the river. And I read you the account of the Catholic priest who in the river looked up and saw that the flames reached as far into the sky as, as I could reach. This is again something else that's being, you know, I showed you where the great Hinkley fire in Minnesota was estimated to be at least five, the flame column estimated to be at least five miles high. Well, this is nothing that's being combusted by material down on the surface of the earth. You know, you're not, even in the biggest forest fires, you're not going to have a flame column five miles high. But we're going to jump through all of this. I can get, anybody would like to get this full account to read? Oh, it's very good. So a lot of this stuff, a lot of the research that you're reading here was stuff that I dug up in 95 and 96 when I went up there and interviewed people and went to the fire museum and so forth. And a lot of it was unpublished in 1995. In fact, the thing I want to read to you at the end was unpublished. It may, you know, it, by now it may have found its way on the internet. I don't know. I wouldn't be surprised if it did. But when I accumulated most of this stuff 12 or 13 years ago, it had not yet been seen, seen the light of day for 100 or 150 years. This is still the Peshtigo fire. Okay. Still the Peshtigo fire. And this is, this is all the stuff that, uh, it's very moving to read what these people experienced. You would think it would use up all the oxygen if a flame was five miles high. Yes. Yes, you would. And we'll, we'll get, I'm going to jump to the, <clears throat> okay, I've underlined a few things that you see consistently through these accounts. Like here, the air itself was on fire. Yeah, well, Charlie, that's what one of the things that the tornadoes do. You know, whenever they have big fires, it, it triggers tornadoes, and the tornadoes cause a tremendous uplift, and it pulls air into the bottom to keep the fire going. It doesn't take the oxygen away from yeah, the fire. It brings new oxygen in from, the, from around it and sucks it in toward the face of the tornado and then the tornado acts as a, a big chimney. Well this is what, when you read these accounts, what you see is th they do describe a giant cyclone of fire. Yeah. That's what they describe, a whirlwind of fire. Here you see, this is from the account of the priest when he's down in the river. Notice this, now here, this is actually from a book that was published in a limited publication back in the 70s where the, he gathered together a number of eyewitnesses accounts. Notice the time, about nine o'clock a strange sound burst upon our ears coming from the southwest. As it, at first it seemed a great way off, but gradually grew nearer and nearer until, as if by magic, a sea of flame rolled in upon us and mountains of fire rose up around us. Rushing furiously forward, the flames would leap high in the air, then dive to earth again, seemingly meaning to leave nothing unscorched or living here and there bursting forth and spreading as fast as I could discern until it seemed that the whole heavens were on fire and the earth to be but a vast pit of fire wherein all must perish. How frightful, yet how grand, how indescribably grand was the sight. Yes, it must have been. So, we will go on. Oh, interesting analogies that people make. The first fire comes on, the roar increased, and burning coals began to drop in the village, first like stray meteors of the night. Now, of course, if you've been paying close attention to the last two meetings, you'll know that what I've been implying all along is that they were, in fact, meteors falling to earth. But meteors alone aren't going to be enough to set the sky on fire. No, oh, I wish we had a whole day to spend just getting this, but, okay, so here, yeah, your readers may wonder what I mean by fire balloons, and I confess that I hardly know myself and only use the term because it was so frequently used by others in conversation with me. All of the survivors with whom I conversed said that the whole sky seemed filled with dark round masses of smoke about the size of a large balloon which traveled with fearful rapidity. These balloons would fall to the ground, burst, and send forth a most brilliant blaze of fire, which would instantly consume everything in the neighborhood. So what was well, that's what we're coming to. 
Um, you guys are able to, you can read this, right? I'm not going too fast, am I? Right. <laughs> okay, here. Here's a survivor. A feeling that something was going to happen hung over the city. The fire came so suddenly, it was like the heavens opened up and it rained fire. See, and they will repeatedly say, the fire didn't come from the trees. It didn't come from the forest. It came from the sky. At about 9 o'clock Sunday night, a terrible tornado swept down from the southwest through the western side of the county, carrying death and destruction in its awful career. Over here again, notice right there, the atmosphere seemed to be on fire. Now, that's, now, get, now notice, you probably didn't get this, Sturgeon Bay Advocate. This was on the other side of Lake Michigan. Oh. Yeah. Yep. The other side, see, the other side of the lake, the same deal. The reason we don't remember it is because it was in an uninhabited area and only probably 100 to 200 lumbermen in lumber camps got wiped out by it. But it was the same deal. The rain of fire came down on both sides of Lake Michigan. Yeah, this is um, what the people went through is really difficult to imagine. At some point, there needs to be a blockbuster movie made about this unappreciated, unknown, totally profound episode in American history. <laughs> and this is, again, is the other consistent. On, on the handout I gave you, I listed the characteristics of these great firestorms. This was on that list, believing that the day of judgment was surely come. One of the repeated things is that people didn't even attempt to save themselves because they thought, obviously, if the sky is on fire, this is the end of the world. This is what the scriptures have been warning us about. Now it's here. What's the point of even trying to save ourselves? The fire which destroyed Peshtigo occurred on the evening of the 8th, and history has never furnished a parallel of its terrible destructiveness. Shortly after church-going people had returned from the evening service, an ominous sound was heard, like the distant roar of the sea or of a coming storm. This increased in intensity, and soon the inhabitants became alarmed and apprehensive of coming danger. Balls of fire were observed to fall like meteors in different parts of the town, igniting whatever they came in contact with. No tongue can tell, no pen can describe, no brush can depict the realities of that night. Exaggeration would be utterly impossible. It defies human ingenuity. It was the destruction of Sodom reenacted. It seemed as if the wickedness of the place had mocked God until his fiery thunderbolts were loosened for its destruction. But now he who had been boldest in sin was first to call upon his maker for succor. Now I find again the, the reference to thunderbolts very interesting because we have seen that thunderbolts are a symbol for what? Comets descending, yes, absolutely. The character of this fire was unlike any we have ever seen described before. It was a flame fanned by a hurricane and accompanied with various electrical phenomena. Those that survived the terrible ordeal testified that they received electrical shocks while they saw electrical flames flash in the air and dance over the surface of the earth around them. Electrical. See, this was another of the unique characteristics. We'll go on. Let's keep going. So there's a map of the area we're talking about. Um, and there's showing at least where some of the firestorms simultaneously broke out. See, here's the map. This is Lake Michigan. Chicago is right down here. Peshtigo is right up here. So you can see the fires burned up along the west coast of Green Bay. They burned up the Door Peninsula. They massively burned the west, the east side of Lake Michigan. And over here, also, they were also major fires that broke out that night in Wisconsin, uh, west of here, Minnesota, and Iowa. But they're, they're very poorly documented. Yeah, so this was a guy, he stayed in a, he, he survived in his well. 
a deep well. He jumped down in his well and was able to survive the passing of the firestorm. Um, again, another analogy. Uh, it was as if the, everything had been shaved off and swept with a broom, and nothing but soot and ashes were to be seen. When we look at the, um, the pictures of the aftermath of the Peshtigo fire, you can see how clearly, or the Great Hinkley fire, you can see here how complete was the destruction. The day before, this had been an old growth forest with 150 foot pine trees. Now, as far as the eye can see, it's just been completely erased. The firestorm that did this was 30 miles wide. It moved for 100 miles across the landscape, and it left a swath of complete destruction, as you see here. More destruction than you could probably even rot with, with nuclear bombs. This is burying the dead, the aftermath of the Hinkley firestorm. And this is <laughs> the story of Jim Root. Now, see, you can put this in the movie, too. This was the, the, the train that rode into Peshtigo. The only people that survived, for the most part, were these people who got on the train. And what they described was this. The train came in, the people loaded on, and the cyclone or tornado of fire advanced towards them. Jim Root, the engineer of the train, threw the train into reverse and started going back down the tracks as fast as he could. But no matter how fast the train would go, the tornado of fire moved down the tracks and eventually caught the train and engulfed the, the, uh, the engine. And Jim Root and his brakeman and his coal men were all operating the train while they were on fire. Finally, they stopped at this swamp, and everybody jumped off the train, dove into the swamp. The fire tornado came and passed over, and a lot of them were able to survive by laying down in the water. And they were laying in the water, as it shows here, they were deer. But when you read the descriptions, they were in the water with bear and foxes and all kinds of wildlife were in the water with them. And nobody gave a shit about each other because they were all completely <laughs> terrified about the passing firestorm. So, now we get to the question. What started this fire that became such a tremendous sea of flames and rolled for 20 miles and took so many lives? As is the case with most other great forest conflagrations, the cause and place of origin will never be known. I have been over every square mile of the country, if not every acre, and have talked with many survivors. I have read hundreds of contemporary reports of eyewitnesses. Nobody knows or ever knew exactly where this fire started or how. That was written in 1943. But um, we'll look at a few of these accounts. The fierce, because they contained the clues to understanding what this phenomena was. The fierce flaming heat became so intense in certain localities it created what seemed to be a vacuum. The vacuum would then quickly fill with violent and explosive gases. With a river so near, there would have been time to seek safety in flight, and even to have removed goods if no greater danger menaced the townspeople than an ordinary forest fire. But when fire burst over the town, it came in fierce explosions and in streaks, with suffocating, choking gases that paralyzed the victims even before the burning. It came too quickly for analysis. It baffled science. It could not be accounted for. It was a phenomena that dis defies all description. It did not crawl or creep, but burst and exploded. It roared, seethed, and boiled. On the ground, it swept forward in walls and cylinders of flame. In the air, it soared in massive balls of fire and gas. Its heat was intense and searing, and it devoured kingly pines in minutes. Which we saw in Chicago, the accounts of whole buildings just melting within three to five minutes under the intensity of that heat. My great-grandfather worked for the railroad at the time of the Great Hinkley Fire. My brother recently came across some old journals of our grandfathers, and he wrote of his father, Wilbur's experience, when the railroad company sent him to Hinkley, Minnesota to restart the railway system. Apparently, a fire started in a non-combustible area. Eyewitnesses insisted 
the fire came from the sky like a huge ball of flames. The townspeople were so terrified they crowded onto the only transportation out of town at that time, the train. Hundreds scrambled to get in and on top of the train. They hung on to windows anywhere that they could get hold on to get out as fast as possible. Uh, we'll jump down. Some try to say it was just a bad forest fire. But my great-grandfather spoke to the frightened survivors in person and they all said the fire came from the sky. Some said great balls of fire were burning in the air and there was no forest nearby. This is from Duluth, which is like 100 miles north of, or 75 miles north of Hankley. Great whirlwinds of flames flashed in the early evening sky with a strange and awful result that left viewers with a depressed feeling. The sky did not light up from one direction, nor was there a single bright glow. The whole vault of heaven became a glowing furnace, dull and ruddy in color, with the appearance of intense heat. The phenomena, at least 50 miles to the south of Duluth Superior, appeared outside the range of known denominators. The firmament seemed a vast mass of molten metal threatening universal destruction. Many Scandinavians thought it looked like Ragnarok, the end of the world in Norse mythology. And here was a poem written by survivor Horace Wilcox. The fire swept o'er us with terrible wrath and left desolation and terror strewed in its path. The flames approached with a sickening crash, and fair Hinkley Town disappeared like a flash. But Hinkley saw another sight as the afternoon grew dark as night, when, like the handwriting on the wall, the population recognized Jehovah's call. Fly for your lives, come let us fly, that we may escape the fire that descends from the sky. So by turning to these accounts, we can get a sense of an idea of what the Greeks were talking about with ekpyrosis. Now is it possible that what we're seeing here could occur on a global scale? This was the last. In the series of these great cosmic firestorms, the Big Burn of 1910 was the, was the last one. And interestingly, this author notes the connection between the appearance of Halley's Comet the same year as this fire. And we saw this last, this is one of the things it did to the forest, but we saw that several eyewitnesses insisted that they saw a falling star begin the fire. Another witness, the man insisted that a star had fallen by setting a small fire. Thus, the great 1910 fire began in Montana. Smaller fires had already been raging all over the state, but they were under control thanks to a firefighting force of 3,000 men and soldiers all in the woods. But the fire that began on August 20th was different. <coughs> August 20th, what's significant about that date for those of you that have been paying attention? August 20th, not the Leonids, the Perseids, yes, the Perseids. All right, so I'm going to reveal the secret of the cosmic fire. 